us today is the curator at the American Defenders of the Bataan and Corregidor Museum, located in Brook County uh, Public Library in Wellsburg. A former photographic intelligence specialist in the Navy, Brockman earned a master's degree in archives, museums, and historical text editing from Buchanan University. He has worked for the Pittsburgh History and Landmarks Foundation, Slippery Rock University's Department of Community and Economic Development, and Western Area Career and Technology Center in Cannonsburg, PA. Please welcome Jim Brockman. Thank you, thank you. As she said, my name is Jim Brockman. I'm the curator of the National American Defenders of the Tan Corridor Museum in Wellsburg. Up the road. <laughs> Not that far. We just expanded. <laughs> we just expanded to the, uh, to the tune of 4,500 square feet. Uh, so uh, if you're interested, please come up. It's open 10 to 4 every day, you know, including on Saturdays. And by appointments in the evening, and all that kind of stuff. We just uh, expanded it because two of my board members said, you need more room. And here's six hundred thirty thousand dollars you can expand. So I did. <laughs> what did I expand? <laughs> anyway, we have a conference center with flat screen TV with uh, its own kitchen. We, have, we actually have three kitchens in that building right now, and we have uh, a, a lot of tech stuff here. We have an art gallery. We have a room devoted to uh, guys from Wellsburg and, and, and uh, also from Wheeling and various other locations that weren't in Bataan, but we're veterans, and so people drop stuff off all the time to us. Recently we got, um, I don't have a slide with me on this one, but we got the only one of two, it's only two in the whole, the whole world, uh, the U.S. High Commissioner's flag that flew over the Philippines from 1936 to 1945. And uh, it was, uh, we think it's Francis B. Sauer's flag, uh, it's an American flag, it's got, you won't find it on the web, I can tell you that right now. Uh, and it's got 13 red, white stripes, and blue field, and a swimming sea lion. And that flew there. So he absconded with that when he left, when he, had, when he left by submarine, and we figure it's his. We confirmed that with the MacArthur Museum, MacArthur Memorial folks, when they were up here doing our dedication. So it's uh, a neat collection. Uh, we have the 20th Air Force collection. We have Hitler silverware from his house in Munich, Germany. We have 100 year old riding boots from the Italian army. Uh, we have model ships and uh, other pieces like that, but most of it is both in Bataan and Corregidor. We have 1,600 diaries from POWs. So today I want to tell you a little about Bataan Death March. Uh, how many of you have been to the Philippines of Corregidor? Anybody been to Corregidor, Philippines? In that, in that neck of the woods? I was. Unfortunately, I was there. It was hot, wet, and nasty, but anyways, I was there. If you ever get a chance to go overseas, go to the Philippines and go to Gregor Island. It's a, it's a memorial now. And it's a museum and you get to go in Melinda's home and you'll see that where MacArthur, as they call him, dug out Doug. He uh, stayed in the tunnel when other forces fought. But uh, today, I want to show you a few things. And these guys, if you take the history, I don't like that microphone. Can you hear me? Okay. I'll walk around a little bit. These guys heard about 1939, 1940. They heard about the fact that something was going to happen in Europe. Okay, so most of the guys around here in West Virginia signed up. They had the highest rate of an enlistment in World War II in West Virginia. So they enlisted, hoping they weren't going to go to the other side of the pond over the Atlantic in Europe. They end up in the Philippines. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about. Oh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about one gentleman who was in the reserves in 1937 and lived in Wheeling, and I'll tell you about it a little bit later. But anyways, they all thought that something was going to happen, and they were right. MacArthur was over in the Philippines. He was a Supreme Allied Commander. Eisenhower and all those guys were over in Europe, and things were happening in Europe, okay, 1939, 1940, and they started building up the war effort in uh, 1940. The question was, did FDR decide to make us enter the war by using this as bait at Pearl Harbor? Okay. 
So these guys joined up. The guy up in the right hand corner is named David Abraham. He just died a couple years ago. He's 99 years old. The guy next to him with the gun was Joe Parr. He died two years ago. They're all POWs. Leading up to December 7th, 1941, we had the fleet in Pearl Harbor. The question was, historians are always questioning whether or not this was bait for the Japanese to bomb Pearl Harbor, or was it something that they had just done? Well, the research indicates that was, that was the winter anchorage. They would fly over, to drive over their boats over to uh, Hawaii, stay there, go back to San Diego, Seattle, San Francisco. They did this all the time. But the question was, did they bait, did we bait them? Huh. Did we bait the Japanese? Now, the Japanese decided to have what they call a co-prosperity sphere of influence. And this is the, and it didn't really hit that point too far outside of Pearl Harbor. So as we all know what happened on December 7th, what people fail to realize is something else was going on in the Philippines on December 8th. And what's unique about our museum is the history of what happened on December 8th is told up in, in our museum uh, with a lot of information. The same time they were bombing Pearl Harbor, They're bombing Clark Air Base, Air Base. Sometime around October, 19, October 1941, a message went out from Adam Stark and it said, we think it's going to be the Philippines. We don't think it's going to be Pearl Harbor. We got that wrong, right? They did not supply the Philippines. December 8th, the same time, almost to the minute, they bombed Clark Field. They bombed other, all the bases around uh, Luzon and Manila. And by December 24th of 1941, they gave up Manila. Okay. The problem was all the guys we had on the Clark Air Force became foot soldiers. Now I'll tell a little story about this one guy I'm going to talk about. His name is First Lieutenant William Perlman, Medical Corps, 1937-1946. I have a huge collection of his, his artifacts. He writes almost daily home. He writes about everything that's going on. Sometime around when he got over there, and I'll show you a slide of his itinerary in the PO camp. He's the four POW camps, some of the worst POW camps in the Philippines and in, in, in Japan. He writes home and says, had a great trip over, cost $450 to send somebody over there, and uh, I'm, things are going well. So, they were stationed on two places. They were stationed at Batan, Prairie, Manila, and uh, on the Fort McKinley. Sometime around October 11th, 1941, he sends a letter home and he says, all the white women are gone. If you come to my museum, I'll show you a manifest in USS, USS Grant with, with um, Wainwright and his whole entourage and his wives and all that stuff. What he meant by that was all the dependents were sent back in October 1941. They knew something was going to happen. They weren't sure what was going to happen. They knew something was going to happen. The Japanese were in Manchuria. They were in, in uh, Formosa. They were all over southeastern the southwestern coast of, of uh, eastern coast of, of, the, of the Orient and we cut the oil off. Okay. So we were delegated to Bataan, Corregidor, just outside of Manila down there, and that's where our forces were. Willie, as he signs his letters, wrote a thing every day. He wrote about the life down there. He wrote about having a good time and stuff like that. So, as the as the war started to crank up, Palma arrived in Luzon 
on December 24th, they're already in the Philippines. They bombed the heck out of Black Fairbanks. There are no planes to be had. Eddie Jackford, who lives in Wellsburg, West Virginia, was a plane mechanic on B-17 and B-18 and B-10 with the more planes. So they all came foot soldiers. They lasted four months. We did not supply them. We got documentation says we're not going to. We got a letter up in the uh, up in the museum. It's MacArthur says, "Don't worry, boys, help's coming." <coughs> MacArthur likes to write flowery letters. The other letter he wrote was, "Great job, you get the bomb crashed out of you, but you're doing good." <laughs> <laughs> it was a rather long letter. You know, the letter only says MacArthur on it. Yeah, he wrote, he wrote letters like that. General Wayne Wayne, Bill King, by April 9th, decided it was enough. It was enough. We had no supplies. They were forces. There was no other choice but to surrender. Now, you remember Wayne Wright. If you know anything about Wayne Wright, they, they call him skinny. He was about five foot nothing and, and uh, weighed about 80 pounds. They call him skinny. But anyways, Wayne Wright was on Corregidor. Now, this is, the, this is the sore spot with Hama, General Hama, when he's decided, i got to get rid of the guys on Corregidor. Because if I don't, I can't go in the middle of May. Because they're bombing heck out. They were still fighting in April of 1914. So Wayne writes in the tunnel, by this time the gardener made his famous boat ride down to uh, down to Australia and he found himself on a top. He always put himself up in the hotel. Actually, I was down to Memorial a couple weeks ago. Half this, half this collection of books that caught fire in there were all gone. It was the hotel caught fire. And he always put himself on the hotel. They call him Dug Dug Dug. These guys are stuck on this island. It's the mouth of the Manila Bay. And the Japanese wanted it. They invaded it. The problem is, missing wise, we have 66,000 people to deal with, 12,000 Americans. With both, both women and men. Sometimes they wrote books about it. This is the best song. This is from Anita, Anita Redden. She retired from the military after the war. She wrote a book about it. It's the best seller, 1943. And uh, so they had all these people to deal with. How do you deal with 66,000 people on the death march? His uh, almost ideal was to march from 66 miles up the coast to two prisoner camps. With two prison camps. It lasted seven days. You fell down, you got shot or stabbed. You died. Lester Tenney will tell you, unfortunately he passed away, he would tell you every day, every time you saw him, I actually buried them alive because they fell down. <clears throat> if you even attempted to escape, you'd be shot. Two days after the death march, stay, death march uh, started, they handed out paperwork. It says, those who try to escape or attempt to escape, those who attempt to escape and disguise themselves as civilians, those who inflict injury upon the inhabitants or those who move or set fire on April 12, 1942 will be shot. You're, you're, you're out of water, you're out of food, you practice and not standing up until they get hands a piece of paper so don't do this. <coughs> Think about that. They had no way of getting those guys up there unless they walked. 66 miles. They got up to a place called Camp Agonal. And they went to the Grand Farm Prison Camp, they went to Camp Adama. Now, here's a curious note about this. When Wayne Wright went and saw Hama about surrendering, he said, you're a pretty well-like commander. And Wayne Wright says, no. He said, we're back to the So skinny, as they call him, stayed up all night worrying about this, what he's supposed to do, so he got a hold of the guard and says, Regardless, if you're not the Supreme Valley Commander, he goes back 
Muhammad, Muhammad won't talk to you. His aide says he won't talk to you. We have the documentation in the museum. So he says, we're, we're going to surrender. So we also have the recording of the surrender, too. It's kind of interesting. So they made them negotiate and then eventually broadcasted over the radio that the U.S. forces surrendered in the Philippines April 9th, 1942. Seven days later was the end of that march. In the meantime, Corregidor was still being occupied by our troops. And it wasn't until May 6th, 1942, that they gave up too. Juanita Revan, for instance, she uh, got out on the TPY. And she writes about this. She actually got a medal with uh, Mrs. Roosevelt. So what do you do with 66,000 men and women? I said I wanted to tell you about Bob Pearl because he is probably the most accurate documentation of what a POW went through. Okay. He writes in this one, this is, this is the briefing document at the end of the war, and he writes and says, I joined in 1937 active duty for February 6th, went on active duty February 2nd, 1944, and he got released from active service in 1945, September 19, 1945. That, that paper you see on the right, on this right hand side over here, is every prison camp and every place he went during that time. You will note though, when you look, when you talk to these guys, their war didn't start on December 7, 1941. Okay. They will not talk to you about what happened in Europe. No. Their start on December 8, 1941. Some, they're down in, the, down in the southern Philippines, said their they're started on the 10th. Their death march started on the 10th. So you have to be careful with dates. I have people come to the museum, they want to change the dates. No, you can't change them. Don't change the dates. <laughs> it screws everything up. Because the International Day Line, and some, when some people surrendered on the, on the 9th, some people surrendered on the 10th, depending on where you were, what out you were in. Doc Perlman says here he was 35 years old. He writes in there, I'm not married yet. <laughs> but anyways, he, uh, he wrote a very interesting synopsis of what happened to him. And he writes in his last letter in September 1945, at the bottom here, when they got liberated, he summoned the finest ship in the face of the surf. The finest medical ship. We know when he was in Manitowoc, we know when he was in Villabot prison, he was in some of the worst prison camps in the face of the surf. Villabot was still in existence. They use it as a uh, state-run prison for the Filipino government. It's huge. It's horrible. Right. He arrived at Fort McKinley in August 1941, left Fort McKinley December 14, 1941, arrived at Philippine uh, Women's uh, University, that's St. Thomas. So he was moving around pretty good, and then when the war broke out, he got sent all over the place. Bill Blood prison camp. He went to Formosa. Uh, he was in Mojo, Japan. Uh, and he would keep going on. This is his, this is his enlistment picture outside one of the barracks before, he, before it all, all hell broke loose. And this is his POW picture. We have a whole bunch of his POW pictures. Sometimes you look at them and you wonder how they ever survived. Mm -hmm. um, you, you can take a look at some of these up here when you get up to that point there. Doc Perlman survived this. Mm. Okay, the Hell Ships, descended by ship. They would spend 30 to 60 days on the ship in the hold. 3,333 men died, perished. Mm. 
Okay, this is the age of Baru. This here picture here, that's a funeral procession that came out of one prison camp. 400 people died a day to ban upon prison camp. And this is one of the prison camps on in Japan. They worked for the companies such as Mitsubishi Materials, Mitsubishi Mining, uh, Michon Flower. Uh, they, they, they made them work six days a week, 12 to 14 hours a day. If you ever play tennis, when you put your hand around a tennis ball, that's all they got to eat besides a tennis ball. That's all they got to eat. If you got caught trying to steal the rice and other food, you were shot. The Japanese are not prepared to have that many people in prison camp during the war. Three and a half years in prison, they placed on health ships. And here's the sad part. We bombed the health ships. Asian Maru had four people survive. Okay. Yoko Maru has a memorial outside of Bravo Piers on Bravo Piers down in Suda Bay right now. It's all the survivors of the health ship and all those who perished. It's the only memorial to the health ships in Southeast Asia. We bombed. We sunk them. Submarines sunk them. We bombed them. If you made it off the health ship, uh, you were very lucky. Danny Jackford was on a health ship, he was on a totem of route, and he survived. They would stop anywhere from 18 to 2,000 people in the holes, and they didn't have very much to eat, they didn't have very much to do, and they pretty much were suffering the whole time. And the prison camps were no, not even, weren't even better than that. Better, any, much better than that. It's etched in their memories forever. They would draw pictures of what happened to them. We have those pictures up there in the museum. What they went through. There's about 80 POWs left. They can tell you what happened December 7th, 1942, but they can't tell you what they had for breakfast. It's how it's just in their brain. Mm. Okay. They're 90 some years old. A couple people did paintings and stuff. There's a whole bunch of art up in the Montana Cultural Center. Um, and it's all devoted to the for everyone. <coughs> MacArthur collection, not the MacArthur Memorial, it's the same thing. There's a whole wall, about as big as this wall, full of archive and material devoted to the Tannin All MacArthur stuff. We have the second largest collection right now that we know of. It marks the 66 miles. It takes an hour to drive by right far enough to the page. They set them up in prison camps. They made them work. The slaves in the docks, factories, and other places like that. For instance, the Filipinos dumped 30, uh, 11 million dollars worth of silver coins in Manila Bay. The Japanese found out about it. That was their cash. That's all the money they had. They made the United States go and took them all off. It was so bad, sometimes you work on a dock and the ship pulls up and says, you're on it. Get on the boat. It wasn't pretty. Some of these camps were huge. As I said before, 400 men died a day. The women had no, didn't have much better. They were at St. Thomas. They suffered just as bad as the How many know what Bushudo is? You know what Bushudo is? Bushido. 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 Yeah. Military. Warrior knight way. Right. You die for the next. You, you, the last thing you do is die. You don't surrender. They could not figure out why you surrendered. 
there's a disgrace to surrender. I have rifles up in there, and up in the museum, and they have a chrysanthemum on them. If you go, we have one that has a chrysanthemum on it, so that means the emperor surrendered to whoever got the rifle. But they'll scrap them, they'll sand them off, and if they didn't, then the emperor surrendered. They didn't understand why we surrendered. They didn't have the logistics to, to, to support this, but they needed they need a slave labor, and they got all the slave labor. <coughs> Guys within a military weighing 230 pounds, they came out weighing 95 pounds. You ever see a guy stand six foot three and weigh 95 pounds? <coughs> Whoops, pulled ahead myself here. But anyways, we have a lot of pictures like that. It's more up here. I'll show you. And they were skin and bones. The diet consisted of rice, corn, fish. <coughs> Maybe some meat once in a while. There was, I read of one prison camp where they had a farm. And Doc Perlman actually said he was on. He went to, the, went to the, that prison camp, and they said, "You can't be a doctor. We already have four or five minutes here in your farm." And he worked on the farm. They had vegetables and they had cattle, and they ate a little bit better. And if you read Doc Perlman's last letter, he said, "I'm liberated, and I haven't really lost a lot of weight. I'm still in pretty good shape." So he's one of the ones that went off. We're in pretty good shape. One of the other problems we have, we like to bomb everybody. And so, from January to August 1945, General Curtis and Mason were bombed into Libya. We have a 20th Air Force production up there from these years. We know all the sorties that they, that they flew. They flew out of Tinian and Saipan. Mm -hmm. we, every mission, they, we, have every, we have all the documentation, every mission, every taxiway, every, every tarmac position they put it on where they put the planes. What they did, too, that bottom picture down there, they're stripping the planes down. You know why they want to strip the planes down? They took the machine guns off the planes because they figured they don't need them anymore. They took everything else out because that weighs, weighs a, bunch of, uh, a bunch of weight there in the plane. So they just put more bombs on them. Okay. <clears throat> Problem with this, sometimes they couldn't take off, sometimes they crash landed, sometimes they took off and crashed. So he put as much bombs on there as he could. This is Colonel Gow's collection, and I have this collection up there, and it tells me every mission he's flown, and there's one that says at the bottom, mission number 38, POWs. They went in after the POWs. They bombed at night, they bombed during the day. Whoops. Bottom picture on the left is Tokyo. They leveled it. They killed 180,000 people. They leveled it. So why drop an atomic bomb on Hiroshima when you level it with the bombs you have? Night and day. Okay. Night and day. To combat this, the POWs wrote POW on the roof of every building they, they had to let people know where they're at. Now that 5B was. Way. 5B right there means that's number 5B Tokyo. Okay. So they put this on the, on the roof so they wouldn't get bombed. They put bed sheets on the roof so they wouldn't get bombed. They continued to do that the whole time the curse of May was bombing prison camps. They flew out of the film, they flew out of uh, Tinian Saipan and they did their job. They bombed Japan. Curtis and Mason on the bomb into the building. Colonel Giles, like Doc Perlman, kept everything under the sun too. We haven't got his collection. We even have his wedding pictures. And it's kind of even have his whole family history. So we can tell the story of pilots, doctors, and just about anybody else that's related to this whole Botanic Great uh, disaster. 
discussion. I got a call from Colonel uh, from uh, Commander Steele one time, and he says, "You know, the ship I'm on is dated uh, the ship named after the worst disaster in American military history. It's yeah, it's the biggest defeat there we ever ran into. We named the ship after the tent. Been down there a couple times. We did some stuff with them." Eighty, hundred eighty thousand civilians died. Look at that picture. There's nothing left. There's nothing left. We dropped the atomic bomb. Now you would think that sometimes somebody got a little bit wise and smart and said, "Hey, I don't want." to happen any, any, anymore. Hirohito called this get together and said, we need, to, we need to stop this. This was in January 1945. And they didn't want to stop it. They thought they could win. After we blew up every aircraft carrier they had. And every battleship they had. The models on the bottom of the ocean. So one bomb killed 100,000 people. Now, if you ever met Mr. Tenney and you talked to him, he said, he would say something like this. He said, you know, we knew something was up. We heard he was out right outside of Hiroshima, Hiroshima. And he said, I heard these planes going over. Every day long. And then one day, we heard this giant explosion. And he goes on to say, after that giant explosion, heard about several days later, the guards came in and said, there's no work today. So that was kind of odd. They came in the next day, and they said, the guards said, there's no work today. Sometime around the middle of September, August, the guards never showed up. If you go on to my website, you'll see a paper that's in Japanese, and it tells the guards, run. Just run. How many watched the movie Unbroken? Okay. Remember the bird? The beat up on, um, what's, what's his name? Uh, he was told to run. He ran into the hills, didn't come up in 1955. So, the bombers don't drop bombs anymore. Bombers brought these canisters of food, clothing, supplies, chewing gum. I have a tape that I'm up there in the museum. And I'll give it to you if you come up sometime, because I have like 9,000 of them. But anyway, anyways, uh, Lester Cole, he said, you know, uh, when we got, when those dropped those canisters, I gave a pound a day. He wasn't much bigger than me, he gave a pound a day. And he said, when we finally got liberated, we put on that Scudano and Destroyer. He had roast beef, and mashed potatoes, and gravy, and butter, and anything he wanted to eat for 20, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They dropped those canisters. I got a, I got a letter up there about one guy. He survived the war and forgot to look up. He got hit in the head with mm. Those canisters, uh, we have a list of everything. They sent clothes, they sent food, they sent everything that they thought they would need. And there was a list. You get, you get a 12 pair of underwear, so they have three t-shirts. I can't figure that out. You can eat all the canned peaches you want. You head over to the can. <coughs> they had canned peaches, they had a lot of canned foods, and they had a lot of stuff. Cigarettes, first aid kits, you name it, they ate. Yeah, it comes from. Yeah. The Japanese soldiers were, run, were, were told to run and hide. They were told to run and hide. So we owned the camps. The problem with it was when they finally figured out the war was over, when they saw an American plane or a ship, they ran towards it. Now these guys don't weigh much. All right. What an embarrassment to send them home weighing 90 pounds. 
So if you read the documentation that we have on this, you'll find out that they did not get home until around November, December 1945. They fattened them up. There's a picture up here, a camp picture. They don't want to base it in here. So they would fatten them up, and then when, they, when, they, when, they, when it was their turn to go home, they would, they would put them on a train, or they'd put them on a, on, on a, on a boat, a ship, or a plane. And send them home. These guys have been gone for three and a half years. They haven't seen a hamburger or a hot dog or anything like that. Think about that. They weigh 90 pounds. So those canisters are very important to that, to these folks. And we have pictures of them dishonoring the uh, uh, Japanese guards and the Japanese guards left. It's not pretty either. Japan surrenders August 15, 1945. Signs a surrender document 1940, 1940, September 2, 1945. A woman comes into uh, the museum one day. And she says, I have this on my, I had this up in my closet. And it's a picture of the signing of the, of the surrender agreement. Mm -hmm from the uh, uh, port navigation deck on the Missouri. Mm. Now, Howard, I have, a whole, I have a whole box full of her husband's stuff we're working on. He was in the occupation uh, of Japan. He just happened to have this picture. And I maybe did the being old Puerto Rican guy, I, I knew that I could get some film to take a look at it. I didn't even know when this picture was taken. Mm. 905, on that Sunday. I don't, because the guy that's kneeling over right there, he's the one with the tuxedo. I can't pronounce his name, there's all kinds of different names. But anyways, the Missouri, it says Battleship Missouri, George was signing. How she got it, how her husband got it, he has no idea. Hmm. has no idea. My first boat I was on, if you look in the back of, in the, back of the, the bay, in the back, you'll see it. It was, it was floating back there. But anyway, uh, they signed the agreement in between September 2nd, 1945, to about Thanksgiving, when they fat the guys up. They got the women out, the nurses are out. Um, in 1944, there was a great lady of Vance one. We had a huge collection of those, too. And uh, that was probably the greatest ranger raid at, at, up to that point. But MacArthur was the Supreme Allied Commander. Uh, he gave out every congressional medal of honor given to anybody he saw. He gave one to Ray he gave one to King. And uh, they did it on Missouri. Now, do you know the table, what the table story is about Missouri? Anybody know? So, you know? You know what the table story is? See that table right here? What are you signing at? That's a mess that table. That, that's a mess that table. That's what you know. They got a wooden, uh, they got a huge wooden desk from someplace in Japan, and they couldn't get it over to Missouri. So the cat at 10 o'clock, at 8 o'clock in the morning, the uh, captain said, we have nothing to sign this on. So they went down to the mess desk. And then cover right there, there's, a, there's another cover on top of that, the green cover was the officer's mess deck table, which is also used as medical, medical, uh, for medical purposes. So it's sitting down at the Naval Academy down in uh, Annapolis, Maryland. But the wooden desk never made it. The wooden desk never made it. So that, that was kept Actually, what happened was, I know this for a fact, too, uh, after the ceremony was over, they took it back down and, and uh, they ate all of it. <laughs> While this was going on, on topside on the Missouri, there was a whole bunch of people downstairs, down below, on the mess decks, uh, negotiating stuff with the Japanese. 
This is their moment. They were still trying to figure out what to do. And we know what happened in some of those. But um, if you go down to Mark, down to MacArthur Memorial, you'll see uh, some of the photos of the signing of this declaration. We have one of the various pieces, that one that we have right there. It's off the uh, navigation deck on the port side of our gun mount. So it's kind of a neat piece. I'm hoping she comes up with some other stuff too. <laughs> but yeah, she'll do that. Uh, some guys made a supreme sacrifice while well, getting everybody back. A.B. Abraham, the guy I showed you at the beginning of the slideshow, was told by MacArthur to stay in the town and dig up the bodies who were buried in the town. He spent two years with them. We're looking for one body right now. If, if I get this one letter back to this commanding officer, he lets me get this one box out of Carlisle, we may be able to find a guy named Sandy Nine or Ben Nine. First congressional the honor in the United States Army. If we know where he's buried, they want to dig him up, bring him back, and they want to put him in West Point because he's graduated West Point. He was the first congressional the honor. He's either an Abaco Cemetery or he's the one he's outside of Manila. He's on the wall of missing, so they can't know where he's at. But Amy knows where he was. Unfortunately, he passed away a couple years ago. But the documentation he gave to the Carlisle Barracks. So we have some of that documentation, we don't have it all. But all I want to do is look at it. They can keep it if they want out there. If we find one one of the guys who are who's buried, then we'll, we'll get the State Department involved and get the military involved and get him back here where he belongs. Mm. Wow. Sixty six thousand men and women were surrendered to. One of the problems you run into is the fact how these 66,000 men and women, approximately 40,000 were Filipino. Mm. And halfway through the death march, the Filipinos got to go home. Jesse Belcher came to my museum, we did old history on him. He was 97 when he did it. I had him autograph a map to show me where he was and stuff like that. And I said, well, you were in the Philippine Army. He said, yeah, at a certain point I was. I was a listed guy. I didn't do medical supply. Then 1942 comes the death march. I get on the death march, and the guy comes up and he says, you want to go home? He said, yeah. I said, go home. I said, what did you do? I said, I went home and spent, spent time with my mother through the rest of the war. And in 1945, he applied to, he applied to uh, USC, got a, got a scholarship at USC. In, Got out and he said, when I finished college, I saw the Air Force recruit, so I joined the Air Force for 20 years. I said, how did you get out of, out of the death march? He said, they said, I could go home. They had all the Filipinos go home. They had all the Filipinos go home. Some of the documentation we have up here indicates that sometimes you didn't know where they were. Mrs. Pearl got a letter, a little card that says, Our records of this office of Lieutenant, First Lieutenant William Perlman, Medical Corps 0357422, has been reported missing in action while serving the Philippines at the time of the final surrender. We now off September 22nd, 1945. Dr. Perlman sent a letter home to his mom. I want to find this fight in the world. I'm going over tomorrow to find out when they're going to send me home. And the Department of War Department says there's a thing we can't find. <laughs> okay? Throughout the, throughout the time they were in prison, shortwave operators would send messages back to the parents, back to the loved ones. We received word of your son, he's okay, or something that way. And it's a short way to In addition, the Japanese would make it go along to send these cards home, and you're only limited to 24 words. And it says, 
here. I received your radio program. I'm happy to hear you all well. Waiting to hear from your content. My health is excellent. I trust that Molly, Murphy, and Minnie and all the children are well. And how, uh, how is Nathan and his family? Love, Harry, Molly, and please don't worry. Son, you're in trouble. Imperial Japanese Army. So you had to check off that you had excellent health, good health, fair, and poor health. You learned it in 50 words. And they would send these home. We had, and the parents could do the same thing. They would send one back. Because our government at the time would tell you he's interned in this camp. Send all correspondence. And they would, they would send you a amount of paper to get a letter back to your loved one in Japan or Formosa or Mockman Prison Camp in China. So they send a amount of paperwork to do that. So you would send, 20, so you'd send 50 words back and forth. <laughs> we have probably the greatest collection of personal histories from the beginning of that party outside of the National Archives. It's a huge amount of paper. We're working on it every day. We have event one uh, great collection, uh, Rio Aviano. Uh, we have the flag branches of Iwo Jima and the bond flags. This country was so actively involved in World War II that during 1945, in seven weeks, they raised $76 billion for the war. At that period of time, we still thought we were going to wait in Japan. I'm going to a museum, I'll show you a ceramic grenade that handed out to women. Women's right? And it's something about powder, let's think about that. About how to blow up Americans when they invaded Japan. Okay. Okay. So that's what we have at the museum. We have a lot of history. These guys went through a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. We have a bill before Congress and the House of Representatives right now in the Senate. Grant them a gold medal. This is the third time it's been up. They've never been awarded. They've been awarded to the American Filipinos last October. They've awarded them to the Japanese Americans last two years ago. These guys, the women and ladies, did not get one of them. They did not, did not get a chance to get one of them. Uh, they tried numerous times. They had all gotten up in committee. Hmm. So, Representative McKinley and Joe Manson have been instrumental in getting them um, a medal before they all pass away. Mm -hmm. But, if you ever meet one of these guys, they'll tell you the stories, like I said before. They can tell you that what happened on December 7, 1941, December 8, December 9th, but that won't be. And I'll tell you what they have for breakfast. Mm -hmm. That's sad. We need to honor these folks. We need to remember this. I had a student class come in the other day about three or four weeks ago, and they didn't know what the first name was up. They did not know anything about the game. We've had Japanese students from Michigan University come over, and that was the first time Japanese students actually saw anything related to the Tanzan market. They spent about 14 hours with us, and we were amazed. Mitsubishi Materials came to us, and they uh, dropped off a check for $50,000 uh, in support of the museum. And the guy, they were so afraid of the backlash from the right-wingers that they were kind of scared when they came in. And we had, we had 75 people in stuff in this room. And we had a few of them, and they, they could only surrender, or they could only apologize to a, surrender, a few of them they had. So they had to find one guy that worked for Mitsubishi Materials. And they found him in California. So they went over to California at the Sound of the Reason Call Center and surrendered, and they, they apologized when they came to our place. And he got up and he, he reiterated the apology. And the, the crowd in the room jumped up and applauded. Thought we were going to do something. Mm. We all scream, but 
he asked how the fishing was in the river down here in Ohio. He said, you should go to more fishing. But anyway, uh, that's the first company. There's 62 companies. And it's kind of funny because if you understand Japanese culture, if you're the first to do something and you screw it up, you lose face really big, really fast. Okay. So it's always good to be number two or number three. That's what she told me. You never, uh, you're never number one. You're never number one. And he did a good thing. I did a painting for him. And it's, it's sitting in the headquarters at uh, Mitsubishi Material in Tokyo. What was nice about it? Great gifts. Saki. Uh, golf balls with their name in Japanese on them. <laughs> hey, we want to go to a couple dozen, so it's kind of fun. But they, they, they thought it was unique that we would have this museum and we would honor those folks, uh, both Japanese and American and Filipino. The Filipino American Society comes down to the museum periodically when we do, we, re we reenact the Death March. Sometime we've done snow down in April, we reenact the Death March in April line. Most of the time, we wait until May. Some place around May 5th or May 6th. And we have a death march, we have army vehicles, we have all that kind of stuff. And then uh, we have lunch on us. But you'll find that this is not talked about. It wasn't until 2015 that they took the chapter of the Japanese history book on Bataan and Terangor and the two other experience. It's not one that's well addressed in our history books for that matter. But someone sometimes uh, professors will bring it up. And so I, I, would, I would talk to the students about that. But it's amazing to see students come in and not know what the translator is all about. Because it's just other than they don't realize.
Um, Dave Jackson is the Treasury Department, is a, is run uh, the Treasury Department and do stuff for those guys. Uh, a lot of them back to, back to work. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to say that uh, William Bratt uh, on the 4th of July, he got, he was a Bill Buck for the camp. Uh, he got liberated. The day before he got liberated, when MacArthur came in on February 2nd, the Japanese told him to dig his own grave. Mm. And he had to hold on. Mm. Okay. He came home, he became a carpenter, got married. His wife's still alive on the boards of the West Virginia. She's 90, 93, 94. But they, they, they're, they're pretty much, they, uh, uh, they, they, they came back and uh, repatriated themselves back into society. So it's pretty good. Any other questions? Any other questions? Were the POWs that are still alive ever paid for their slave labor in Japan? No. Mm. But all the other allied countries Germany were paid. Did. Germany basically said, we screwed up, yeah, you're going to get paid, you get 30 and 100 bucks a piece. It was a, they're still fighting this repatriation stuff. It's still a big issue. Burning issues for some of them. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Everyone probably knows. No. Australia. Well, actually, it's kind of funny to give a, give a, a message up there. Um, we had to give planes to the Australians. <laughs> so we gave a whole bunch of planes. <laughs> they helped bomb me. Yeah, it was a joint effort. It's a British involved. Um, could you go over the numbers that survived? Uh, the Their living conditions, well, the documentation I have on the women at St. Thomas was they, they pretty much lived, they had sanitation issues, they had dysentery, and they had, but they weren't abused like the, the other ones. They were they, like the way God. Did they get into work? Like the men? No, they didn't. No. No, they, they pretty much stayed there. The one woman, uh, well, not uh, the one woman I have documentation on, she says, you pretty much could walk away if you wanted to. There was no guards. There was nothing. They just, they just said, you could walk away, you know, but they didn't. Because they, there was Japanese all over the place. Pardon? Anywhere in the middle, outside of the middle. And she said that they, uh, if, if they had, they weren't, they weren't forced march to work every day in back. No, they stayed right in that pretty much that camp. But it's, it's no call. Well, I mean, like, about 7,000. 7,000. Yeah. yeah 7,000 7, Americans. They, uh, the Filipinos lost 40,000. The numbers are staggering to a certain extent. You don't see this kind of uh, atrocities in the other war. This is the biggest defeat in the history of the American, here in the American military. <coughs> and we didn't do much about it. We didn't do much about it, unfortunately. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.